Well, welcome to Northview. Welcome everyone online, those at all of our campuses. We're thrilled that you're joining us. This is week one of a series we are calling Killing Hostility. And I got to tell you, just the other day, uh, we were walking through the mall, and I was with my daughter, Presley, and we were coming through Nordstrom's, and uh, she grabbed a tie, and she said, Dad, why don't you wear any of these? And I said, well, it's, it's just not really my thing. And she said, is it because you're not good at your job? <laughs> and I said, well, why do you say that? And she said, because people who are good at their job, they wear these. <laughs> and so this is me sending a message. Um, and upholding a deal to my six-year-old. But again, welcome. We are thrilled that you are here. And so much to talk about. And over the next six weeks, we are essentially going to be diving into the book of Ephesians. And I would just encourage you, there's six chapters in the book of Ephesians. Maybe over the next six weeks, just uh, spend each week looking at one of those chapters. And this week was supposed to be week one, Ephesians chapter one. Uh, we're gonna go in a bit of a different route. Uh, I find that there's this comical reoccurrence in my life uh, that before God ever runs things through this pulpit, things have to run through my life first. It's like a, a preparation or maybe a, a practice what you preach kind of opportunity. And I don't know what it's like for you, but I think we all can relate, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, whether uh, you are on whatever side you choose, politically, socially, I think we all can relate to the frustration and the tension and even the confusion that we all face trying to navigate such tumultuous, taboo situations where we're trying to engage in conversations, uh, but we feel as though we're tiptoeing around landmines. Wave at me if you feel like that's the case. It's like, how do you do it? And... I would love to be the standard bearer for you as our community to just say, hey, here is a, a good example. And I'll tell you this, I, I'm trying to lead by example, but you're gonna have to determine whether this example is good or bad. I, but I find that I'm still coming up short in this area. I'm still dropping some balls. And how do I personally engage in a way in the culture and the conversations that are taking place in a way that honors God and edifies the people I'm engaging with. And uh, this week I had a situation that uh, became something more than I expected it to. And in many ways it was insightful, in other ways it was comical. And I thought, hey, here's a great opportunity. Uh, I get questions all the time. Pastor, how would you handle this situation? And I thought, well, maybe I'll just throw myself out there and put myself on an island and put my situation in front of our entire church as potentially a case study for all of us to look at. Hey, would you look at what our pastor did and was a part of? Is there anything here that we can learn? And it has to do with a post I made about the Olympics and the Last Supper. And we are going to go there. Um, I don't know if you are aware, but in the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, there was an element uh, that caused uh, millions of people around the world to look upon it and think, oh, the Last Supper. And I woke up the day after, I didn't watch the opening ceremonies. I woke up the day after and eventually would jump onto social media. And like your social media, my news feed is populated with the people I'm connected to and the people who I've been connected to for years and the, the relationships that I have. And I've said this a number of times, uh, we moved from Minneapolis to Indianapolis and uh, it's been a, a pretty uh, significant shift in a lot of different ways. To state the obvious, Minneapolis uh, is a much more progressive city than Indianapolis. I would say in terms of social matters, uh, it is 80 yards down the field uh, from where our city here is uh, at. And so when I wake up the next day and I get onto social media, the very first mention of the opening ceremonies and the Last Supper was a post that said a drag show rendition of the Last Supper. And there are all these celebration emojis. And this Post was celebrating this drag show rendition 
of the Last Supper. To which I thought to myself, is that true? Like, did they do a drag show in the opening ceremonies of the Olympics as a rendition of our sacred Last Supper? Is that true? And so I, I get online and come to find out the, the Council of Bishops in France had already put out a statement condemning uh, this, this situation. And I'm doing more, like, hey, what's going on here? And I even come across the statement from Elon Musk, who owns Twitter, which is a pretty significant operation, a database of a lot of information. In fact, they pride themselves on their fact-checking department. And he puts out a statement. I don't know if he's a Christian or not, but he just says, this is offensive to Christians all around the world. And I start to read statements being put out by the Roman Catholic Church and so on and so forth. And I jump back onto social media. And again, my newsfeed still early on is populated by individuals who were celebrating the fact that they did a drag show rendition of The Last Supper. I jump into the comment section just to see how people were responding to this. And at the top, an individual said, I don't get it. What's the big deal about the Last Supper? And I thought to myself, man, that's, that's a good question. I wonder how many other people right now are having that same question. So I wrote a post, 370 words to be exact. 93% of that post, which I did the math to do an audit on myself, said nothing about the Olympics, said nothing about any group of people. It was 97% was a brief explanation as to why the Last Supper means so much to us who follow Christ and have surrendered our life to his lordship. And talked about the meaning, the purpose, the, the tradition, the ritual, and the substance behind this sacred um, element of our worship. But the first two sentences in that post, and it's still out there, um, my goodness, did they receive some backlash. And this, this post got so much more traction than I expected. In fact, I'm terrible at social media. My stuff really never gets much engagement. Uh, this one seemed to be very popular. And so I, I start to receive all this, this feedback, and the talking points were very consistent. And I just thought to myself, well, is there anything in here that we can learn? Is there anything in here that maybe as we jump into this series, Killing Hostility, here's a, a goofy situation that as your pastor, I just found myself in. Maybe there's some errors that I'm uh, guilty of myself and maybe there's some things that we can learn from the feedback I heard. Uh, I'll just put myself out there and we can stare at it and see if we can grow together as a community. But to list off the talking points, the talking points that came in and they were unanimous. In fact, many of you shared the post and I looked at your feedback and you were getting the same talking points. The first talking point was it wasn't the Last Supper. They weren't doing a rendition of the Last Supper. Maybe you heard this one. Okay, that's the first talking point. The second talking point, which was a follow-up to the first one, was it was a celebration of the Greek god Dionysus and the Feast of Bacchnalia. Did you hear this? It wasn't even about your god. It was about the god of Dionysus and the Feast of Bacchnalia. Okay, good to know. The other talking point that I heard is newsflash, pastor, our sexual ethic has changed. And I was hearing this a lot from Christians, individuals professing to adhere to the faith and God's word were reaching out to me, explaining to me that I had fallen behind the times and that our sexual ethic had changed. That was one of the talking points. Another talking point was Christians are just too sensitive and too easily offended. So that's one that we should probably address too. The fifth one was, well, if you're gonna make a statement about this being mockery, why didn't you say anything about what Trump or Biden did during Holy Week leading up to Easter? 
this past year. Okay, well, let's, let's look at that one as well. And the list goes on and on. And I thought, well, I, I did not really think that post would gain that type of traction. But what I will say is it did bring to the surface some conversations that became very apparent. Oh, these are things people are talking about. These are conversations you're wrestling with. Your kids are wrestling with. Your coworkers are wrestling with, and maybe you personally are also wrestling with them. And I thought to myself, well, maybe we should just lean into it. I could care less about defending comments that I would ever get on social media uh, or even a post. Uh, but I do think, for whatever it's worth, I did initiate a conversation that came with some blowback, and I just think, uh, well, now we're in the tension. We might as well stay with it. I think that's what we're all looking for, right? Can we be people who can sit in attention and have a productive conversation, or do we come and bump heads and get mad at each other and then just walk away, or can we reason well together? Can we have the conversation? And just know this, you have full permission to disagree with me today. That's okay. A lot of people disagree with me. In fact, I have staff members who I would say uh, probably would disagree with some of the things I, I've said and even the posts that I put out, and, and that's okay. I know some of you are thinking, what kind of leader has a staff that disagrees with them? I'd say a wise one. The, the struggle that we're finding in the world that we live in is people do not know how to function, let alone survive, in an environment of disagreement. People are being exposed of codependency that is paralyzing them. The challenge of thinking critically and independently for yourself has become too daunting for individuals and it is terrifying for most people to ever consider personally and publicly owning their own opinion. There's codependency. We would rather live in the echo chambers of society than in the truth of our convictions. How do we reason well? How do we approach these conversations? And now I gotta read a passage of scripture that'll frame this conversation. After the Last Supper, we find that Jesus heads into the garden uh, to pray and to ready himself uh, for the passion story. He's going to be executed, crucified. It's, it's gonna be horrendous. And he tells his disciples, hey, would you pray with me? And he goes away and he prays. He comes back, they're falling asleep. He says, wake up, I need you to pray with me. He goes away to pray, he comes back. They've fallen asleep for a second time. He comes back a third time in verse 41 of Mark chapter 14. It says, returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough, the hour has come. Look, the son of man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the 12, appeared. And with him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs and sent from the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi. And kissed him. And the men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near him drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Now, who was that individual? Peter. Yeah, other accounts tell us it was Peter. And other accounts also tell us that Jesus says, hey, put the sword away, picks the guy's ear up, heals the guy on the spot. That individual's name was Malchus. 
Verse 48, Jesus asks a question. He says, am I leading a rebellion? Said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to catch, capture me. Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts and you did not arrest me. But the scripture must be fulfilled. Verse 50, then everyone, his disciples, then everyone deserted him and fled. And in this moment, you, you have what I believe is a pretty clarifying spectrum. I think we like to put people in boxes and I think that does the disservice to all of us. I think we all live on a spectrum and in some ways we're all connected to each other through it all. I think in this moment you have Judas and you have Peter. I would say that Judas represents false affection. He says, I, I love, it's basically saying I love Jesus but my life doesn't line up with it. It's giving him lip service, but not life service. He represents false affection. He approaches Jesus and he says, Rabbi, and he kisses him on the cheek. But what's really happening? He's betraying him. He's handing him over. He looks as if he loves Jesus, but he's living in a contradiction. I would say Peter represents false confidence. Peter who would say bold things, I believe you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God, I believe you are mighty, you are powerful, you are the savior of the world. Yet when push comes to shove, Peter has more confidence in his sword than the God that's standing next to him. That's false confidence. Peter cuts his ear off. And this week, I discovered in myself, I'm a Peter. I don't know where you're at on the spectrum, but maybe I lean in Peter's direction. And to be honest with you, I, I don't think Jesus needs me to defend him. I don't think God needs our protection. He doesn't need our help. But this Jesus is precious to me. He is remarkable. He is astonishing. He is my ultimate treasure. And I am learning to manage the impulse to fight for the honor of my king. I'm a Peter. And what's amazing is Jesus makes this statement. He says, rise. Let's go, here comes my betrayer. And Peter interpreted that as, oh, it's go time, let's fight. And he misinterpreted that. And I wonder if maybe you can relate to me where sometimes I too have the impulse, it's go time, let's fight. And I just wonder if I need to as well try to discern the heart of God in moments that are challenging. You know, what is interesting to me is what leads up to this moment. Jesus says, hey, would you pray with me? And they are found sleeping. And I think this is probably the tragedy for a lot of us who identify as Peter. We have a tendency to fall into complacency. And then a moment happens and we're jolted out of our slumber and then we overcalculate and mismanage the moment. We have these spurts of boldness, but then even once Jesus is betrayed, we then just flee and desert him once again. We're inconsistent and we're marked with complacency. But I, I just thought, okay, well, maybe we should stay with these conversations a little bit more. Maybe we should just continue leaning into the tension, and I believe we can be a community of people that learn to figure some of this stuff out. And again, you're gonna, dis this is just one man's interpretation and just, here's my thoughts. When it comes to the, the feedback, it wasn't the Last Supper. To be honest with you, I don't really care to win this argument. I would say that it is amazing 
just to see this situation and how it unfolded. The individual who uh, programmed the ceremony came out and said, it wasn't my intention. I was not uh, trying to do a rendition of the Last Supper. And I just think for the sake of our conversation today, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Okay, it wasn't your intention. Maybe as an artist, you would find it intriguing to just consider the fact that something that wasn't your intention somehow brought to mind this sacred moment in history for individuals all around the world, not just conservative American evangelicals. No, Christians and non-Christians all around the world looked at it and thought, the Last Supper. And I would say this, if if it wasn't your intention, somehow God is good, and though I had some errors, it's still brought to the forefront and made once more famous the name of Jesus and the Last Supper. But we will not argue whether or not it was the Last Supper because we'll give you the benefit of the doubt. What was interesting is they did come out and they say it was the Greek God, Dionysus, and the Feast of Bacchnalia. And I had so many individuals let me know, hey, clearly you are just very uneducated and misinformed as a leader. You've not done your research. To which I have to agree with them, folks, they're right. When it comes to Dionysus, the Feast of Bacchnalia, I was completely uneducated and misinformed. I have to confess, I did not do my research before the Olympic ceremonies. In in fact, in, in full confession, never once in my life have I felt the need to study just to watch the opening ceremony of the Olympics. But this is kind of the dynamic we live in. Things that we used to just do casually without concern now require a great deal of mental energy. And we have to really think through, okay, what am I looking at and what am I experiencing? I took it slightly personal because I would pride myself in being an academic. And in this moment, clearly there's all these people quipped with this talking point, it's Dionysus and the Feast of Bacchnalia. How don't you know this? I didn't. And so I, I went to some books And I'll actually share with you some of my my sources so you can fact check me if you want. I always tell leaders, there's nothing new under the sun. If you wanna say something new, you have to read something old. One book, A Historical Account of the Heathen Gods and Heroes, published in London in 1731, was a good resource. Another book, A History of All Religions, published in 1859, uh, another book, we'll go to, A Dictionary of Roman Coins, Republican and Imperial, uh, was published in London, 1889, that also had some things about this. Another one, Under Divine Auspices, Divine o- Ideology, and the Visualization of Imperial Power in the Severan Period. This was put out by Cambridge, actually, in 2012. Probably my, my favorite one was The History of Rome, put out by Titus Livius, who is without a doubt the greatest Roman historian who published an entire library of history on Rome and was published around 27 to 9 BC. And if you go to book 39 in Livy's document, uh, commentary on the history of Rome, Livy speaks about Bacchnalia. So, Book 39 is where you'll find that. Also, a dictionary of science, literature, and art, um, published in 1852 in London. These were all sources and that informed me on what, who Dionysus is and what the Feast of Bacchnalia is. I gotta tell you, I wouldn't have said anything about it had it not been tied to the Last Supper, full confession. My only response was because I seen the Last Supper involved. But now that I've done some research, I feel like, oh, now we should probably talk about this. Apparently, Dionysus is a Greek god 
And the Greeks and the Romans shared a lot of traditions, a lot of beliefs, a lot of myths. A lot of times they called it separate things. And this is where maybe you've seen some inconsistency in the language. Some are referring to them as Bacchus, and some of them are referring to them as Dionysus. In many ways, it's, it's the same God they're referring to. Um, the Feast of Bacchnalial is the Feast of Bacchus, and Bacchus is Dionysus. Does that make sense? That's kind of hoping to clear the muddy water. Dionysus was uh, the child of uh, a mortal and an immortal. So there were two gods, and the wife decides that she wants her husband uh, to have an affair with a mortal, to which he does, and the woman becomes pregnant. Now pregnant with the child of a god, she immediately bursts into flames and she dies to which the child is then placed in the womb of the father or in the, in the father, to where the father, Jupiter, then carries the child and gives birth to Dionysus, who was born of a father and had attributes of both male and female. And this God would eventually be known as the wine God, the passion God, fertility God. There's all these different celebrations. And these feasts, would develop around this God and the Feast of Bacchnalio. And it, it just grew. The, the wine feasting became so extravagant with drunkenness that these feasts became every single month for five days, they would just, um, they'd sell out to these matters, we'll say that. It wasn't just, it wasn't a feast of food, it was a feast of passion. Come to find out, the feast of Bacchnalia was a, a cult gathering. And their, their standard of life was nothing is illegal. That was the mantra of their, their religion. Nothing is illegal. One of the books I read said it had become the sewer of corruption. What these gatherings and these festivals were known for were extreme rituals and initiations that consisted of abuse, rape, pedophilia, and orgies. Individuals who would show up at these gatherings and discover what they were about, who refused to participate, would be tortured and some were murdered. Eventually, this was brought to the Council of Rome. Hey, there's a lot of corruption. So Rome finds some inside sources to begin investigating the Feast of Bacchnalia. This is a terrible situation. To which they outlaw Bacchnalia. They say, hey, this is, this is a terrible thing. We should not be participating in this. So Rome actually decided to outlaw this. Now, here's what was interesting. In one of the articles, it, it says, despite being outlawed by the Roman Senate in 186 BC, the Bacchnalia festival was simply too popular to be outlawed forever. And it was brought back, the drunken hedonistic celebrations of the Bacchnalia were carried out with full fervency during the imperial period, as noted by authors such as Virgil, Livy, and Juvenal. These are literally, I mean, early historians. I, I mean, before Christ and first century historians. He says, it would not be until the moralizing of the Christian era that the Bacchnalia and other pagan rituals were again outlawed and eventually faded into history. I'm gonna say this one more time. It would not be until the moralizing of the Christian era that the Bacchnalia and the other pagan rituals were again outlawed and eventually faded into history. It's amazing. I, I had so many Christians reach out to me and say, duh, pastor, you're uneducated. This is the feast of Bacchnalia. Didn't you know? And then I did all this research and I'm like, did you? Or were you just quoting a talking point? 
So many individuals said, well, pastor, the Bible says you need to be slow to speak. Yeah, but it doesn't say you shouldn't speak. Well, pastor, pagans are gonna pagan. Well, yeah, and cowards are gonna coward. There was once a community of believers who had such an influence on society, such an influence on the world that the moral compass began to change and they looked at corruption and they looked at immorality and they said, this is not okay. We're better than this. We're better than this. Christians are just too sensitive. I don't know, there's probably some truth in that. I would say in full confession that I, I've discovered in myself this week, I, I got offended. Again, I, you mess with my Jesus and something in me is just like, I'm ready. And I don't think what we're dealing with is just offense. I think what the community of faith is dealing with is just as much grief as it is offense. I think we are seeing a catastrophic shift within our world, and we are recognizing that we are stepping into a new normal, and what once was, chances are, won't be again. We're learning to now enter into this new frontier. One article I read said that we are living in the greatest sexual revolution in the history of the world. And you can look around, you don't have to be a Christian to agree to this. Things sexually are changing rapidly. And they are happening at such an alarming rate. I don't know what it's like for you, but it's hard to process and develop your thoughts as it's seemingly forced upon us. You know, it was interesting this week, my, my daughter, Riley, she's, she's doing well in the game of basketball, and she got invited to uh, visit and tour Yale and work out uh, with the basketball team there, which was a, a really cool opportunity. There's never been a Johnson in the history of the world ever associated with an Ivy League school. Uh, we're just not of that standard. So I got to tag along with Riley, and I knew this summer would be the summer that I was going to give Riley her purity ring, her promise ring. I guess you can gather if you've been around long that I'm really sentimental. I just think things should carry meaning. And I've been thinking, how am I gonna do this? And when Riley got invited to Yale, I'm like, that's how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna take my daughter to what is known as one of the smartest places on the planet. And I'm gonna encourage her to make one of the wisest decisions she could ever make. Would you live a life of purity? Fight for your purity. It's gonna be hard. Culture's gonna try to tell you to do different. You are going to face daily pressure, but there will come a moment in your life where you will get to experience God's beautiful and wonderful design, and you will be so proud that you lived a pure life. You fight for your purity, and you know your dad has your back. We had this great conversation, and Probably one of my favorite conversations I've ever had with my daughter. And we, we started talking about love. And she asked me a question, how do you know you love mom? And it was this great conversation. And I have this document that I started, I don't know, maybe four years ago, where I just started writing things down that I love about Kristen. I've not even told Kristen about it. I've never shared it. I just didn't want to forget some of these things that pop into my mind that make me think, oh, God hooked me up. And... Um, so I was telling Riley about this, and she's like, he pulled out, and so we're sitting at this table, and we're laughing, reading all these things, because most of them are, are, are pretty insignificant. They're just funny. Things like, I love how when my wife gets excited, she has to punch the air. That's just her thing. When she gets excited, she's like, <laughs> you know, she just <laughs> throws some blows. I love that every time she holds my hand, she has to pop my knuckles. I don't know why she does that, but she has to make sure every knuckle is popped, and then we go on with the deal. She's ever eaten a salad, she has to have a perfect bite. 
There has to be a pecan with a piece of chicken, the strawberry, the goat cheese, and a leaf of spinach. It has to be uh, the perfect bite. There's all these things I love about her. Um, I told my daughter, I said, Riley, I, my biggest prayer for you is that you would not settle. And she said, how, how do you best know when you're settling and when you're not? I said, well, Riley, if you ever get to a point and you think to yourself, man, I think this guy loves me as much as my dad loves my mom. I think you're in a good place. What was wild is I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm having this moment with my daughter and my phone is blowing up from Christians letting me know that our sexual ethic has changed. Guys, I... I'm a Bible teacher and I'm pretty straight laced. I, I take a great deal in pride in studying God's word and trying to do the very best that I can to teach it with effectiveness and gentleness to where, where we all can do this well. You have to do some very creative theological gymnastics to make the Bible say something it doesn't. And I believe that anything sexually done outside the arrangement of a marriage between a man and a wife, Scripture defines as sexual immorality. And my, my fear sometimes in these conversations is, like you, I have family members, I have friends who live very different lifestyles than I do. And I have spent years investing and engaging into those dialogues. And it is sometimes challenging knowing that I have to be a bit of a spokesperson for this community of faith where a lot of my statements are done publicly that I know come with um, just personal implications as well. And I know you can probably relate to that. But there is a significant change. You know, this conductor, programmer of the ceremony says, hey, it wasn't my intention. <clears throat> okay, that's fine. We'll give you the benefit of the doubt. What was interesting to me is simultaneously, there was another controversy unfolding online. A guy by the name of Bob Ballard, who... Uh, works for Eurosports, which is a branch of Warner Brothers, was covering the gymnastics. He's a commentator, and he has covered the Olympics since 1980. The man is approaching a half a century. He's covering the Olympics, and there comes a point where they're about to do the medal ceremony, and they're waiting on the Australian girls team to come on out. They're taking longer than expected. And on camera, Bob makes the statement. He said, oh, they're just ladies taking their time, putting on their makeup. To which his co-host immediately responded, outrageous, Bob. Men wear makeup too. And what was interesting is this 15-second clip goes viral and Bob was fired immediately. Bob comes out and he says, my intention was not to offend anyone or be disrespectful. Yet they put out a press release with this man's photo, you know, letting the world know that they have immediately terminated him for his inappropriate and offensive sexism. And I thought to myself, I'm going to be in trouble at some point. <laughs> because I have often mentioned the fact that in our home, when it comes to getting ready, the girls take a little longer and makeup is involved. 
I couldn't believe that this man was getting fired for this. As if this was some crude, sexist statement. Across the board, speaking generally, us guys actually do not spend as much time getting ready as some of you ladies. In fact, in my shower, I have a product that is put out by Crew. And it is called the three-in-one. <laughs> Shampoo, conditioner, and body wash. Because when us men get in the shower, we're like, just give me one substance. I don't have time for this. <laughs> to say, well, Bob, men wear makeup too, is like one of you women saying, you know guys just passing gas and burping all the time. And one of us guys saying, well, women pass gas and burp too. But this guy was terminated. One guy plans a tribute to a cult festival known for rape, sexual abuse, orgies, and all kinds of things, pedophilia. And he said, well, it wasn't my intention to offend anyone. And the whole Olympic committee says, oh, give him a pass. And they defend him. Bob comes out and says, the girls are in the back powder in their face. And he's fired. Part of the hostility in our world is the radical inconsistency within our standards. The rules of engagement have become so confusing. Can I get an amen? amen? But simultaneously, while Bob's getting fired, there's an Italian woman stepping into a boxing ring. A woman who's trained her whole life to, to be in the Olympics. And she steps into a ring to fight a man who now identifies as a woman. And this girl gets absolutely pummeled, takes two devastating blows to the face, she falls to her knees and she cries out injustice. Afterwards, they interviewed her and she said, you know, my, my dad taught me to be a warrior. Come to find out her dad is ill and she's trying to honor him in the Olympics. It's this great story. And she said, I spent my whole life fighting my older brothers. There's never been a fight I backed down to. And then she made this statement. She said, I've never felt pain like I felt today. And this is, again, it's interesting. Here you have Bob getting fired because he says, Women are powdering their face. We now live in a world where you can't say women powder their face, but a man can punch a woman in the face, and that's considered sport. These are radical inconsistencies. It's irrational. And as people of sound mind, we have to learn how do we engage in conversations that help other people see the errors in our thinking? And how do we do this together as a community that actually moves towards peace and unity? The trans conversation I know is becoming the paramount conversation in the world. And I know it's, it's a difficult one. You know, this week I came home from this trip with my daughter and it's my son's 13th birthday. We're celebrating his birthday, and midway through the birthday celebration, it starts to rain. And I don't know if you live in Noblesville, but my goodness, um, did it feel like the story of Noah and the ark again. Our area got five inches of rain in under an hour, and the power went out, which meant my basement completely flooded, which was terrible about four inches of water. Come to find out, my flood policy has this small disclaimer in the uh, fine print that if the flood ever involves a power outage, the policy's void, which is fantastic. 
So Team Johnson jumps to it. All right, we're going we're gonna to mitigate this water together. So we get all these dehumidifiers and, you know, we get all these big fans and get this big industrial vacuum that just sucks the water out. So I'm just down there sucking all this water out of my basement. And eventually, I mean, my carpets start to look pretty good. And you can relate to this. I'm, I'm sucking up all this water and it's making these perfect lines. And the OCD in me, like many of you, find myself now with the challenge of I have to make this perfect with these lines. So I'm vacuuming the floor well and my daughter Presley comes downstairs. I've got the whole floor almost perfect and she just starts tap dancing all over the floor. <laughs> Footprints all over it. And I said to my daughter Presley, I said, your lucky dad loves you because you're messing up his design. And I wish I could sit with some folks and just say, you're lucky God loves you because you're messing up his design. These situations are not going away. How we learn to honor God and carry this thing forward is important. What's interesting about the story of Peter and Judas is Judas will throw your theology through a bit of a ringer. He's kind of a strange necessity in the story. Somehow God still uses it. And I'm confident even in the situations that we're facing, somehow God will still use it. You know, what's interesting is there's that statement, rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. And Peter thinks, that means rise, let's fight. And clearly, Jesus makes it clear to Peter, Peter, you misinterpreted me. What do we see Jesus do right after he makes that statement? We see him rush out to meet Judas. In that, in that moment, Jesus rushes out to the mob to have one last interaction with Judas to let him know, I'm still open to a relationship with you. And in this season, I, I'm discovering that I'm a Peter and I'm wondering if there's anything that maybe I'm doing, maybe if there's anything that you're doing that is hindering those who would align or identify as Judas, discovering a Christ who still rushes out to them, who says, I'm still open to a relationship with you. And there's that statement where Jesus says, why did you bring clubs and swords? You think I'm leading a rebellion? I've been teaching in the city. I've done no harm. Why are you bringing all this stuff? And I thought to myself, if I'm those individuals, how would I answer his question? They got together, they made a plan. Judas informed them where they were at. Let's go get it. Why did they bring the clubs and swords? I don't think they brought the clubs and swords because they were concerned with what Jesus would do. I, thought they, I think they brought the clubs and swords because they were concerned with what Peter might do. And they were right. I think in their planning meeting, they said, hey, the, the leader's a class act. He'll take it like a champ. But his followers have a tendency to lose their mind. And Peter proves them right when he chops off an ear. And I think maybe the point in all of it is maybe all of us should just start dropping our weapons and learning to address these matters differently. What's interesting to me in 1 Corinthians, and I close with this, is when Paul sets up the Last Supper in communion with the church in Corinthians. Look how he says this in chapter 11, verse 23. He says, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
Now look at that statement. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and broke it. That when Paul would teach churches and orchestrate communion, the thing that was pressing upon his heart was Judas. On the night Jesus was betrayed. And as someone who is realizing I've got more Peter tendencies than I am proud to admit, maybe, maybe I'm guilty of missing the point that if there's any message that cannot be overlooked about the Last Supper, it is that Judas is always on the heart of our God. There's a song that I listened to called Because of Christ, and the, the first sentence is my favorite lyric in the entire song, and it says, on a hill in Israel, mercy spoke for me. On a hill in Israel, mercy spoke for me. And I find myself engaged in conversations just like you and the same way on a hill in Israel, mercy spoke for me. Maybe once again on this hill in Carmel, Indiana, does mercy just need to speak for me once again. Jesus Christ, the one and only begotten Son of God, left perfection and stepped into our brokenness. He laid down his life as a ransom for your sins and for my sins to extend to anyone and everyone the gift of salvation. That those of us who repent of our sins and surrender our life to him are forever changed and saved for all of eternity. And that is the mercy of our God. Would you pray with me? God, we just thank you for, God, just your grace and all the times in which we come up short. God, it is in this season that we're looking to you for guidance and for wisdom and for strength as we learn to honor you, represent you, but also add value. God, all throughout scripture, cover to cover, you address the idols of the day and you raise up voices of prophets to address those matters with great courage. And God, would you just help us discern when the moments in front of us call for that type of response, would you help us leverage our voice in a way that is effective and wise and gentle? In Jesus' mighty name we pray.